Um, our next speaker is now officially emeritus from a school that sometimes has a football team and sometimes is like the Gators. Um, University of Central Florida, uh, Joe, Don Joe Donahue will be speaking about the ups and downs of sea level. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're now in the Big 12, actually, which is a big deal for us. Um, yeah, I want to thank um, the Institute and uh, <clears throat> Jim Dunbar for the invitation. Um, when Jim asked me to give the talk, he, all he said was sea level. <laughs> it was just two words, so that was the, that was, that was the parameters. So I thought, uh, being a geologist, I would just uh, try and get into uh, uh, sea level over geologic time to try and allay people's fears about, let's see, how's this work, about, that's uh, no, not working, there it is, um, the, you know, these kinds of headlines about uh, sea level rise. This is just, you know, this is just in human time. As long as we're not talking about human time, sea level is not a problem. Sea level's been rising for uh, as long as there's been sea, seas, which is uh, 3.8 billion years, uh, almost the whole history of the Earth. It's been rising and falling, uh, and um, with much greater amplitude than what we see today. So I, I just wanted to put things in kind of in perspective. Um, so the modern shorelines look like this, and um, interestingly, uh, the shorelines have looked like this for about 6,000 years, maybe a little, a little longer. Uh, if you, um, if, you, if you think about it, it's not coincidental that uh, that's also the time during which human civilization has developed. I mean, farming started not long before that, about eight, eight or 9,000 years ago, and we started living in cities and towns. Uh, so the stabilization of sea level, which is related to the stabilization of climate in the Holocene, uh, and human civilization have gone hand in hand. However, uh, 20,000 years ago, Sea levels look like this. This was the global shorelines uh, during the last glacial maximum when um, the ice sheets covered the northern tier of, of, uh, of continents uh, to about 30% of the land area. Uh, and that was at the expense of the level of the sea. So the seas were drawn down about 120 meters uh, 20,000 years ago. And if you notice, for instance, Florida, uh, the shorelines got a lot wider, as you've seen in a couple of illustrations. Uh, just recently. So look, if you look at Florida uh, 20,000 years ago and compare it with, with today, uh, 20,000 years ago it was about 400 kilometers across the peninsula, and whereas today it's, it's more like 200. So Florida basically doubled in size. And if you wanted to go to the beach from, say, Cedar Key here, uh, you'd have to walk an extra 200 kilometers. And you'd have to carry your umbrella and uh, you'd have to wear a parka because it was a lot cooler. So this, that, this was the last glacial maximum uh, 20,000 years ago. Um, I'm gonna show you a different version of uh, the uh, long-term sea level curve than the one that uh, Chris just showed you. This one go, uh, goes out longer, but it's basically the same database. So this is from uh, oxygen isotope data from uh, deep sea sediment cores primarily, except for the last couple mi uh, last million or so years, which comes from ice cores. But um, this database, which I'll show you different versions of, goes back uh, almost 100 million years. This is just the last two million years. Um, and it's, it's really the gold standard of long-term sea level. Um, beyond tide gauges, which is 1850 AD forward, um, we don't have direct measurements of sea level, obviously. So, um, oxygen isotopes are the standard for measuring sea level and, and radiocarbon uh, over the short term, the past 50,000 years. But what, when we talk about geologic time, it's, it's oxygen isotopes. What you see right away in a plot like this is the la there's the last glacial maximum at uh, 20,000, and sea level bottomed out at about negative 120 meters. Uh, you also might notice that the spacing uh, between the glacial advances, uh, let's see if I can. So uh, e each of these upspikes is an interglacial. This is the most recent one. The next, the next to last one, the last interglacial is right there, uh, about 120,000 years ago. But the spacing between the, these advances, the glacial interglacial 
uh, cycles is about, is about 100,000 years out to about uh, 1.2 million right there. Uh, beyond that, uh, two things happen. One is that the amplitude of the swings in sea level become less and the spacing becomes less. The spacing in that case is 40,000, officially 41,000. And, and what's happening there are the, these guys, the Milankovitch cycles. You've you probably heard about this. These are the three main orbital cycles that um, affect climate, which affects sea level, at least over the moderate geologic time. So eccentricity, uh, very briefly just to explain, um, eccentricity is just change in the shape of the Earth's orbit, where uh, the orbit goes from nearly perfectly circular, which would be zero eccentricity, to um, slightly more egg-shaped. That affects season, seasonality. Uh, right now, summers are about five days longer than winters, which is one of the reasons why we're in an, an interglacial. The second one, obliquity, it's a little more subtle, it's harder to see, but it, the, the axis actually tilts a little bit. So right now it's 23 and a half degrees, and it varies by about a degree on either side of that. That affects seasons too. If there were no tilt, if, if the, the tilt of the axis relative to the sun were 90 degrees, we'd have no seasons. So this too is seasonality. That's a 41,000 year cycle, the one that applies out beyond 1.2 million. And then precession is the last one, and that's basically uh, the orientation of the axis um, the way it points. So right now it's pointing to Polaris in a half cycle, which would be 13,000 years, it'll be pointing towards Vega. All of these things affect seasons and that affects climate, which affects sea level. All right, so those are the, the uh, so-called Milankovitch cycles, uh, eccentricity most recently, and then uh, obliquity out w well beyond this, this curve. And then I'm gonna expand actually contract the uh, x-axis and we'll look at 66 million years. And I, I picked 66 million for a reason and that is that um, that's 66 million is the end of the Mesozoic. That's when the dinosaurs bought it. Uh, it's when the asteroid hit in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and wiped out life as we know it. 75% of all uh, extant species died off. It was almost the end. Um, so this is the whole um, Cenozoic era, 66 million. But what you see here, again, is a couple other interesting things. There's the Milankovitch orbital cycles. And so these are those closely spaced uh, swings of sea level, uh, tens of thousands of years between one event and the next. But notice what happens beyond about 10 million. The spacing becomes more like a million or two or three million. So these are, are tectonic cycles, that is tectonics. Changes in the uh, orientation and really the speed with which the Earth's plates are moving, um, it, generally apart from each other, uh, affecting sea level. And I'll explain better in a minute. Um, just as an aside, yeah, this was the time, I, I put this in because this, this, this isn't long-term sea level, but it is probably the time when uh, we had the most catastrophic and maybe the highest sea level ever, the catastrophic rate of sea level rise. This was something that we don't always think about when we think about the dinosaurs dying. So that the asteroid actually hit right there in the Yucatan, which was in, in water at the time. So it hit in the Gulf of Mexico. And there was a study done last year, uh, uh, modelers, uh, looking at all the parameters we know about the, the uh, asteroid. And they said that, um, number one, the uh, there was a tsunami, obviously, and the tsunami went around the world. It affected Australia and New Zealand and uh, the Mediterranean. But in the immediate area, in the western Gulf of Mexico, the uh, sea level momentarily, for maybe for hours, uh, rose more than 200 meters, 200 meters. So it was probably an all-time high. So that's, that was 66 million years ago. Um, I didn't plot this up, but 100 million years ago, um, we, we probably did have the, lo, lo, the highest long-term sustained sea level. I'll show you that in a minute. So um, long-term, what drives sea level, as I said, is changes mainly in the, in the um, 
shape of the mid-ocean ridge. The mid-ocean ridge is the biggest feature on Earth except for the continental platforms. It's 65,000 kilometers long. And what happens during a time of uh, slow spreading, so it's spreading apart. This would be like North America, in the diagram, there's, this would be North America and this would be uh, Africa or Eurasia. So it's spreading apart. Um, right now, the average is about three centimeters per year. <laughs> um, this is considered a time of, of slow spreading. During a time of rapid spreading, which I'll show you in a minute, late Cretaceous, uh, about 100 million years ago, it was about three times that. And what happens when it's spreading more rapidly is the ridge complex, which is basically it's a mountain range. This is the size, even today, it's the size of the Appalachian Mountains, the same kind of relief, about 2,500 meters total relief. Um, when it's spreading uh, more like three times this, uh, sea level goes up commensurately. And so you get high sea level during times like that. So during the late Cretaceous, uh, about 100 million years ago, the Earth looked like this. So this is uh, 200 meters above present sea level. And notice what North America looks like. Of course, Florida wasn't there, obviously. Um, North America was pretty flat. There were no Rockies, uh, no Cascades, no uh, Sierra Nevada yet. Um, and the seas flooded the continent. You know, this isn't an ocean. It's just a, 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 a shallow sea sitting on top of the continent. And it uh, enabled mixing of faunas from the Arctic and the tropics. So in, in Kansas today, you can find late Cretaceous fossils that are, are a mix of those two. <clears throat> so that was probably an all-time high sustained sea level. And then um, another thing on this figure is, um, and you actually heard about this uh, uh, just a little while ago, the uh, late, uh, from Bruce McFadden, the uh, late Paleocene, early Eocene climatic maximum, it's a, it's a mouthful, uh, about 53 million years ago, um, sea level was also at a near record, 130 meters. And what drove this was, this, this was a time of rapid spreading, and so you, you had the uh, tectonic um, sea level. But at the same time, uh, and I think you heard, you heard about this today too, um, there was a, probably an all-time high in uh, CO2. CO2 levels at this time were about 1,000 parts per million. Uh, compare that to t today. Right now it's about 420 parts per million, um, a lot of which is our own fossil fuels. Um, during these times when sea level bottomed out during these glacial advances, uh, it was never, it was normally about 180 during the interglacials, except for the present interglacial, they were never above 280. But anyway, today 420, but this was 1,000, so that too was overprinted uh, on, on sea level on the sea level record. So um, this is what um, the 53 million year sea level looked like. And again, Florida isn't quite above the waves yet. Florida was just a carbonate platform at the time. At highest point in Florida is 105 five meters. So this is late, uh, early Eocene sea level. Uh, another interesting aspect of, of this curve is uh, what happens when the ice sheets start to develop. So the uh, Antarctic ice sheets start to develop uh, around 37 million years ago uh, in the late Eocene, and it's sporadic in coverage until about 11 million, and then there's full ice uh, covering Antarctica by about 11 million. Same thing in the north, but later. So in the north, Northern Hemisphere, about 8 million years ago in the late Miocene, ice starts to form and it's uh, more or less continuous by about, about 3 million. So what the world looked like then would be something like this. So th this would be, a, a, this represents 40 meters sea level. And the Earth looked like this. And um, Florida, at this scale you can't see it very well, but there is, there is some points, there are some points in Florida that are above the waves and here's what Florida might have looked like then. This is 40 meters. This is the 40 meter contour. So, yeah, so, sorry about the roads. The, the roads weren't there. But <laughs> 98 might have been there. But. 
It's pretty old. But um, what, what you see is uh, Lake, Lake Wales Ridge. The highest point there is about 77 meters. And Trail Ridge, about, about the same. And then this northern fringe is the Tallahassee Hills. Highest point in Florida is right about there. It's in uh, northern Walton County, 105 meters. So Florida, at this point in the late Miocene, would have been, um, you know, barrier islands, basically, and a little, you know, some highlands. Okay. What I want to do now is expand the scale and look at just the last, uh, last two glacial cycles. So I have to go out 220,000 years, and the scale goes like that. And what you see is the, again, last glacial maximum. You see the last interglacial where it was warmer and the sea level was higher, maybe as much as five to 10 meters. And you see two cycles and, and they're similar in shape. Uh, the, the next to last one was not as, not as warm, but the shape is the same. That is the shape of these curves is basically a, a slow deterioration in climate, maybe 90,000 years or so, and then a more rapid uh, warming, about another 10,000 years. So Florida would have looked like this during the last interglacial, about 25% submerged. But, so that's 120,000 years ago. And then um, finally, I want to grab just the last 20,000 years. So on a scale like this, and with data like this, which is oxygen isotope data, um, it looks like the run-up from the last glacial maximum was pretty uniform, monotonic, but it, it really isn't. And it's, it's, it's because of the sparsity of the data, and it's a different database. This is oxygen isotope, but, but when you use a different proxy, which is radiocarbon dated artifacts from the continental shelf, measuring both the age and, and the depth at which they were living, uh, and these are things that, that would have lived at sea level, like freshwater peat or uh, shallow water corals or barnacles or oysters, uh, you get a whole different picture. So this is specifically for the Gulf of Mexico, but uh, curves uh, like this have been generated for all the stable coastlines all around the world, and they all look much the same, and you'll see similar features. So I want to, just want to point out uh, some of the features. <coughs> First, of course, the last glacial maximum at, 20, 000, at negative 120 meters. Uh, and one thing, one big feature that shows up, and you've, you've heard about this already as well, is right there, the Younger Dryas, uh, which was about a 1,200 year period during which uh, in, the, in the long run up to present, the warming uh, and, and the rising of the sea level, there was a slowdown. In fact, uh, the glaciers in, in, at least in Europe, actually slowed down and, and probably advanced a little bit during this time. So it was kind of a mini glacial in the midst of the interglacial warming. Uh, another feature of interest, let's see, yeah, that's working. So the, the uh, animation over there shows why this happens. So what, what happens at about 8,000 in these curves is um, the slope changes. So we have a steep slope up until 8,000 and then a, a less steep slope up to about 6,000 and then zero. Uh, and the reason for that, you can see over here, is the ice was gone by about 8,000 in North America. And, and, and in, in Europe as well. So, um, yeah, this is the melting history. One final thing to uh, notice is these last 6,000 years, sea level has risen uh, almost not at all. It is rising today. That's the level that the satellites tell us. The last 20 years, sea level uh, on average has been rising 3.7 millimeters per year. It's, it's pretty minimal. Uh, and, and that's probably as high as it's been in the past 6,000 years. It, it, but uh, when, when I show you the, the rates from some of these other excursions, like this one, uh, you'll see that, that, that this is, is pr pretty slow relative to geologic time. <coughs> uh, I want to take a, a brief look at just one of these excursions, uh, at this one in particular, the one that occurred at about 8,200 years ago. And uh, what, what happened there was 
um, as the ice was melting uh, along about 10,000 or so years ago, uh, meltwater lakes formed around the edges of the ice. And some of these lakes were the biggest ever in North America. And there's the one right there, you see the name of it, Lake Ag it's actually two different lakes that have coalesced, Lakes, lakes Agassiz and uh, Ojibwe. Uh, and those lakes were temporary, temporary in the sense that uh, they eventually failed, but uh, they were there for about a thousand years or m many centuries. But uh, they were prevented, the water was prevented from running out through the water courses into the, um, either the, uh, the western path, which would be the Columbia, or the southern path, which is the Mississippi, or, the, or in this case, the east, eastern path, which is the St. Lawrence. They were prevented from doing that until uh, what was preventing them failed, and that was ice. It was, it was were ice dammed lakes. So, uh, just a little illustration to show how that worked. So this will be a thousand year time slices. Um, this, this was from a study just a couple years ago where, where they put together this, uh, these figures, showing, uh, basically illustrating everything we know about where these lakes were and, and, and how they formed and when they disappeared. So what, what's going to appear in each of these slices eventually is these dark blue uh, objects, which are the lakes, the, the meltwater lakes. You see one right there, which w wasn't directly, certainly wasn't in connection with the glaciers. They never got that far south. It's called Lake Bonneville, and this is Lake Lahontan. Neither of those is there today. There's a little tiny fragment of Lake Bonneville that remains, and that's called Great Salt Lake. But th these, these were there because these were wet times. So these are indirectly affected of the glaciers as well. But what you'll see is the meltwater lakes showing up. So this, every thousand years, and they all have names. These are just geologic names. They don't exist anymore. There's Lake Agassiz forming by about 13,000. And here we are at 11,000. So by 10,000, uh, things started to happen. And between 10,000 and 8,000, all that water, all this water ends up going out here, out this outlet uh, through uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. And there it is. So the reason I bring this up is because this had a, had a direct effect on sea level uh, and on climate. So uh, that big slug of water, which was uh, cold and fresh, came out in St. Lawrence here and basically sat there. And, and you see where that could be a problem. So uh, all this warm, uh, all this warmth and water that normally moves around the Atlantic uh, slowed down or maybe stopped for two to four centuries. So it was a, basically a, a kind of a mini glacial right there. So that's what these events do. Besides raising sea level, they also affected uh, climate, these big meltwater events. So that's called the 8.2 Ka event. 8,200 years ago is when it kind of came to fruition. So what you see in the curve is six of these events that they're all called uh, meltwater pulses uh, and they've been identified with names in the geologic literature, 2A, 2B, et cetera. And they all represent excursions of sea level uh, for much the same reasons because uh, meltwater lakes failed catastrophically. But the interesting thing in terms of sea level is what they represent in terms of the rate of sea level rise. So look at these numbers uh, that I, I just flew in there relative to today's rate of sea level rise. So th this, we, we're actually looking at uh, a much lower rate than we saw during the run up since the last glacial maximum. Sea level was rising at as much as an order of magnitude greater um, back here 15,000 years ago than it, it is today. And even when you look at the average over that 12,000 year period, that's twice the rate at which uh, we see it today. So, so the point is, humans have never seen anything uh, during our civilized time, you know, when we were sedentary, have never seen anything faster than that in terms of sea level rise. But uh, you, you can see the geologic system certainly uh, is, is capable of much faster rates of sea level rise. 
there is good evidence that uh, at, at rates higher than this, certainly at rates like that, uh, coastal systems like barrier islands, estuaries, um, deltas, uh, lagoons can't persist. That, that is, they don't have time to develop uh, when sea level is rising much faster than it is now. So uh, lastly, I'm going to look at um, just the historic record. So this would be the last 200 years or so. <coughs> And of course, this is the tide gauge record. So this is a direct measurement of sea level going back to about 1850. And you see rates like this. So most of the 20th century, sea level has been rising about 1.7 millimeters per year. Uh, slight acceleration in the 70s. And then uh, the, in the satellite era, about 3.7 millimeters per year over the past 20 years or so. So finally, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, you know, the, the UN body of which the, the US take, plays a big part, puts out a report on climate, as, as I think we all know now. Um, every four or five years, they've been doing this for 30 years. This is the sixth one, the sixth assessment report, 2021. And part of the report, this is 2,000 plus pages. Um, this is ju just the scientific uh, part of the report. And this is only, this is not even the whole thing. Um, but what they do as part of the re report each time is project sea level uh, out to, to 2100 and beyond. So NOAA last year put out this report, which took the IPCC projections and applied them to U.S. coastlines. And this is what NOAA uh, projects uh, out to 2100 on average for the U.S. coastline. That, Oh, and by the way, the, the, no, the terms here refer to emissions. So low means substantial cuts in emissions, uh, carbon emissions, and high means uh, basically business as usual. We just keep emitting until fossil fuels run out. So at, at the low, and, and what they say is that uh, this is the more likely, most likely, uh, and that this is not unlikely. But at, at the low level, sea level should rise by 2100 to about 0.6 meters. And at the high emissions uh, level, about 2.2 meters. And what that means is, that in, in graphical terms, it looks like this. All right. So um, the thing, uh, thing about curves like this is that these are, these are exponential. And in, when you convert these numbers to a r rate of sea level rise to get from where we are today to these, these levels, you have, to, um, you have to greatly increase the rate of sea level rise. One meter, which would be the most likely scenario, makes Florida look like this, about 10% submerged, mostly South Florida. Two meters is about 15% underwater. But yeah, here's what happens to the rate now. So when, if you're going from 3.7, where we are now, 3.7, this is now rate, 3.7 millimeters per year to, to get to 0.6, you have to actually be at eight millimeters per year a rate by 2100. And it gets, gets worse as, as you go higher. So uh, the most likely scenario is something like that. And this is not an unlikely scenario. So these are rates, if you go back to here, these are the kind of rates that we saw in the worst case scenarios back during the run up from the last glacial maximum. Finally, finally, if you um, think that's a, the bad news, here's the really bad news. This is from the report, the IPCC report. That's an illustration. So the IPC sa says, yeah, uh, this is where we think sea level is going to be by 2100, but uh, CO2 that is going into the atmosphere now isn't going to go away. It, it's pretty long-lived. And so sea levels are going to keep rising no matter what we do, unless we find a way to extract CO2 from the air, which we haven't done yet. There's that. And then there's also the fact that uh, the, the, there are these ice um, uh, portions of the ice sheet in West Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula, the part that um, 
uh, extends up towards Patagonia uh, that are very unstable. And when you get into these times, so this is 2100, here's 2150 and 2300, so these are their projections. When you get into these times, it appears likely that those uh, unstable parts of the ice sheet could do this. So by 2150, sea level could well rise by six meters. Uh, and by 2300, uh, 15 meters, which would be catastrophic. You know, all the major cities, almost all the major cities of the world would be inundated. So he here's what the culprit is. This is what I was saying. This is, these parts of West Antarctica look kind of like this. That's the Thwaites Glacier. It's this one. It's the size of Florida. And it's being un under, it's number two, one, th one thing it's doing, it's, it's surging about two kilometers per year seaward. And it's being undercut by warming uh, water from the Amundsen Sea, part of the Antarctic uh, Ocean. And what the, what the experts say, the glaciologists say, is that if this continues, there's the potential that uh, the Thwaites Glacier could just peel off. And if it does, you get a 0.6 meter rise almost instantaneously. If all of these uh, unstable parts of the ice sheet uh, depart, you get th a three meter rise. So uh, I'll just, my last slides are just what the world looks like in a three meter rise. So here's, oops, here's, here's the southeast at three meters. This is the, th the three meter shoreline. Florida and, and Louisiana, of course, are the hardest hit. Um, here's Florida more close up. And you can see where the worst hit, again, uh, South Florida is hardest hit. There's uh, even closer for South Florida. And Jacksonville, um, downtown becomes part of the harbor. Uh, Amelia Island pretty much goes away except for the Pleistocene dunes, the, the, the high dunes on Amelia. Um, St. John's River becomes a, a huge estuary. And Melbourne and the Space Coast become pretty much underwater. There, there isn't much on Merritt Island that is above three meters. There's a few spots. And Tampa Bay and the, the Barrier Islands pretty well go away. Tampa Bay gets wider. Charlotte Harbor gets wider. Finally, uh, uh, on our coast, Santa Rosa Island doesn't have many spots above three meters. Um, lastly, here's us today. Uh, we, we're happy here at 70 meters. I, I checked. We're, we're okay. But the shoreline, at, at three meters, uh, the shoreline gets three kilometers closer. So it, it's less of a trip to the beach. And if I, if I recall, I think Jim Dunbar's house <laughs> is right down here near, near 98. So Right about there, maybe. And yeah, so, yeah, not everybody suffers from sea level rise. <laughs> Build those condos now. All right, thank you very much.